Welcome to this webinar on the new tools for seismic and wind loads. My name is Jessica Portaways. I am an Autopipe Mechanical Application Engineer at Bentley Systems. Some of the benefits of this webinar are to provide confidence in the safety of your engineering design with static and dynamic earthquake loads that allow you to quickly define up to 30 cases in one model, with global seismic codes, with wind loads that generate wind pressure versus height profiles for static load cases, and with wind loads according to many different requirements. So let's move on to some of the advantages of Autopipe and what makes Autopipe different from other pipe stress analysis tools. Other tools allow less load cases for seismic and wind compared to Autopipe, which has 30 for seismic and 10 for wind. And this allows Autopipe to analyze more occasional cases in one model. Eight seismic cases are the minimum to accurately capture all the possible seismic loadings in the positive and negative X, Y, and Z directions. And this is just not possible in one model in other tools. So having 30 seismic load cases enables both seismic and transport type motion loads in the same model. And it's very suitable for offshore analysis, particularly for FPSO projects. This is also a tool that's not available in other pipe stress analysis softwares. Using Autopipe's advanced nonlinear analysis accurately analyzes load sequencing per ASME recommended static analysis guidelines. So for example, if an earthquake hits a hot operating piping system, it gives an accurate final state result. Using Autopipe's static seismic point and member load factors can capture the higher seismic loading at different floor levels. This is also not available in other tools. Also, it's fast and easy to turn off wind loading by segments. So for example, when a piping system passes from outside windy conditions to inside a building which is shielded from the wind, uh, this is very easy to apply in one model. And lastly, the combined structural and pipe stress models using the powerful STAD and Autopipe integration allows a combined stiffness model to be quickly generated and analyzed both for dynamic response spectra and for static earthquake analyses, which provides accurate, safer earthquake designs. Now let's jump into today's topics. First, we will start with our static seismic loads. When load static earthquake is selected, the static earthquake dialog is displayed. This dialog enables the user to define static earthquake load cases where forces are generated as multiples of the gravity load in the global X, Y, and Z directions. It's important to understand that because earthquake loads are bi-directional, separate cases may be required in order to consider the effect in both directions, especially if gaps are considered in the analysis. The following fields and parameters are provided in the static earthquake dialog box. First, you have the number of earthquake load cases. Autopipe supports a maximum of 30 static earthquake load cases in one model. There are 20 allowed per analysis set. If the user attempts to add a new static earthquake load case after 30 have been defined, an error dialog will pop up and no new case will be created. There is a new button up top Using this, the user can add a new sequential entry to the static seismic table. There's a modify selected button. This will allow you to modify the parameters of the selected entry in the table. This button does not work for any user type static earthquake cases as there are no parameters to change. There is a delete selected button which will allow you to delete the selected row or rows of earthquake load cases. Load cases with a higher designation than the deleted cases will be numerically reduced to keep sequential numeration. There's also a delete all button, which will remove all of the static earthquake load cases from the model, and confirmation of removing all load cases is required. In the table below, there are six distinct columns. The first column for case is always disabled and represents the load case name assigned to the current acceleration load in the row. The second column is for seismic code. This is where you can select the desired static seismic code from the drop down. By selecting a code, the X, Y, and Z columns are disabled and can be edited by editing the parameters of the seismic code. 
This can be done by focusing on the row and clicking Modify Selected up top. By selecting User as the static seismic code, the X, Y, and Z fields become enabled and entering a custom seismic acceleration is required. The vertical factor column is disabled for user rows. You can enter a vertical seismic acceleration factor that will be applied to the orthogonal direction to create a vertical acceleration. The value has a default of 0.5 and must be greater than or equal to 0. The X, Y, and Z columns are for user loads where you can enter the gravity factor to be applied to the model. For any seismic code selected, these three fields are grayed out and will display the acceleration generated from the parameters selected in the seismic code dialog box. These accelerations are in factors of gravity. Down on the bottom, you have the option, you have the option to duplicate cases. The duplicate current case 2 option allows you to enter a pre-existing row number to overwrite with the currently focused row. For example, by highlighting row 1 and entering 3 into the Duplicate Current Case 2 field and then clicking Duplicate, Autopipe will replace the values in row 3 with those that are in row 1. The available seismic codes are ALA ASCE 2002, ASCE 2010, GB 5001-2001, and the Mexican CFE 2008 code. The Federal Emergency Management Agency formed in 1998 the American Lifeline Alliance as a public-private partnership. Seismic design for pipelines is not explicitly included in current AWWA standards, so the objective of this guideline is to provide a cost-effective approach to seismic design of pipelines as applicable throughout the United States. So there's some options when looking at the ALA ASCE 2002 seismic code, and they include seismic zone, which is used to define the likelihood of seismic activity within the area of construction. The zone 0 through 4 are shown on the top left. The soil type, where the user can select the type of soil that this model will rest on. This soil profile type is used to determine the soil profile coefficient, S, using table 24 of the ASCE 2002 code. The default value is S1. This is shown in the middle table. The importance factor is used to measure the importance of the structure. The default value is 1, and this is shown in the bottom right. Another option is the fundamental period, where the user can enter the fundamental period of the structure in seconds. For ALA ASCE 2002, the default value is 0.1 seconds. There is also a multiplication factor, which is an autopipe specific value that may be used to simulate the amplified acceleration experience by the piping component higher than the ground level. The default value is 1, and it must be greater than 0. So here is a screenshot of the input box for using the ALA ASCE 2002 seismic code, and also the code compliance calculations for this code shown to the right, which can be found in the Autopipe help. The static seismic ASCE 7 2010 code presents criteria for the design and construction of structures sub subjected to earthquake ground motions. The specified earthquake loads are based upon post-elastic energy dissipation in the structure, and because of this fact, the requirements for design, detailing, and construction should be satisfied even for structure and members for which load combinations that do not contain earthquake loads indicate larger demands than combinations that do include earthquake loads. For this code, there are also some specific inputs, starting with site class, which is a classification assigned to a site based on the types of soils present and their engineering properties, as defined in Table 20.3-1, which is shown on the top left. The next available input is the zip code, where the user can enter the U.S. zip code of the site. The zip code field may remain blank, which would then enable the latitude and longitude fields. In the latitude and longitude fields, the global location of the construction site can be entered, and this will automatically be determined by the zip code field if there is a zip code entered. 
If the latitude longitude option is selected, these fields will be enabled for editing and the values from these fields will be used to determine the SS value. For the continental United States, Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico only, uh, Autopipe will round the values up to the nearest. The next input is the mapped spectral response or the SS value. The mapped spectral accelerations for short periods. This describes the mapped spectral accelerations for for short periods as determined in section 1141 of the ASCE 2010 code. The next input is the maximum considered earthquake FA value. This describes the site coefficient for the mapped spectral accelerations at short periods, which is defined in table 11.41. This field is always disabled and it depends on the site class and the SS values. The next is the importance factor. All components are going to be assigned an importance factor as indicated in section 13.1.3. This factor should be taken as 1.5 if any of the conditions apply shown on the bottom left. Continuing with the inputs is attachment height where the user can enter the height at which the component attaches to a structure relative to the origin. The user can enter zero if the model doesn't attach to a structure. If the model attaches in more than one location, the user should use the highest attachment in order to be conservative. Next is the roof height, where the user can enter the maximum height of the structure the component is attached to. If the component is not attached to a structure, this field does not need to be considered. This field must always be greater than zero. Next is the amplification factor. The component amplification factor is taken from table 13.6.1. Next is the component response modification factor, which is taken from table 13.6.1, shown on the right of the screen. And the values are determined by the piping code that's used in the model. For ASME B31 models, valid values are 12 and 6. And for any non-ASME B31 models, the valued values are 9 and 4.5. For autopipe models, this value is fixed at 2.5 and it cannot be changed. Next is show location on map. Here's where you can confirm the latitude and the longitude selected by viewing it using Google Maps. If the SS option is selected, this button will be grayed out. And lastly is the multiplication factor. This value is an autopipe specific value that may be used to simulate the amplified acceleration that's experienced by the piping component higher than the ground level. The default value is one and it must be greater than zero. An important note is that this code does not require the fundamental period and it is not requested for the code parameters dialog box. So here's a screenshot of the input box for the ASCE 2010 seismic code and also the code compliance calculations shown to the right, which can be found in the auto pipe help. The Chinese GB50011 code details seismic design in Chapter 5. Seismic action of every structure should be considered and complied with the following principles using this code. Generally, horizontal seismic actions may be considered and checked separately along with the two orthogonal major axial directions of the building structure, and that horizontal seismic action should be resisted by all of the corresponding direction lateral force resisting members. For structures having the oblique, directional, lateral force resisting members and the oblique angle to major orthogonal axes greater than 15 degrees, the horizontal seismic action along the direction of each lateral force resisting member should be considered respectively. For structures having obvious asymmetric mass and stiffness distribution, the torsion effects caused by both two orthogonal horizontal direction seismic action should be considered. Other structures are permitted to use a simplified method such as adjusting the seismic effects method to consider their seismic torsion effects. For large span structures and long cantilevered structures for intensity 8 or 9 and for tall buildings for intensity 9, vertical seismic action should be considered, which is in section 5.3. This seismic code also has some inputs when selected, starting with site class, which is the soil type the structure sits on and it's used to determine the characteristic period, which is found in table 5142. 
The seismic group, which is used to determine the characteristic period found in Table 5142. The influence, which determines how common earthquakes occur. It's used to determine the maximum horizontal seismic coefficient found in Table 5141, shown here. The intensity, which is the maximum intensity of the earthquake to consider for the region. It's used to determine the maximum horizontal seismic coefficient, again, found in Table 5141. The fundamental period of the structure, which should be entered in seconds. For the Chinese code, the default value is 0 0.1 seconds. The damping ratio of the component should be entered as a percentage, and the default value is 5%. And the multiplication factor, which again is an autopipe specific value that may be used. So here's a screenshot of the dialog box for the Chinese seismic code. And again, the code compliance calculations to the right, which can be reviewed in the autopipe help. The Mexican Federal Electric Commission Seismic Design Manual details a procedure based on a, probable, a probabilistic approach to estimate the seismic hazard in Mexico. The seismic hazard curves are usually interpreted as seismic intensities describing lapses or exceeded in specified return periods. Again, when this code is selected, there are some basic inputs required. The first input is the site class which describes the type of ground the structure is built on. This field is based on table 1-1, which is shown to the left. The next input is the peak ground acceleration, which is the acceleration of the ground at a period of zero seconds. Next is the ground thickness, or the total thickness of the layer of soil with the designated site class. Next is the fundamental period of the structure, which should be entered in seconds. For the Mexican code, the default value is 0 0.0001 seconds. Next is the damping ratio of the component, which should be entered as a percentage, and the default value is 5%. And last is the same multiplication factor, that autopipe specific value. So here's a screenshot of the input dialog box when the Mexican seismic code is selected and the code compliance calculations to the right, which again can be found in the autopipe help. Let's move on to dynamic seismic loads. In autopipe for dynamic seismic loads, we use what's called a response spectrum analysis. A response spectrum analysis is used to determine the response of a structural system subjected to an earthquake excitation. The equation of dynamic equilibrium associated with the response of the structure subjected to ground motion is calculated using the mass matrix of the structure, the structural re displacement response matrix, the structural velocity response matrix, the structural acceleration response matrix, the structural damping matrix, the structural stiffness matrix, and the ground acceleration matrix. A response Spectrum analysis uses results from the modal analysis in order to obtain a solution. So a modal analysis must be performed before a response spectrum analysis is initiated. All assumptions made during the modal analysis will apply. The ground excitation can consist of three independent ground accelerations, which act simultaneously in three global directions. For a particular ground excitation, the response spectrum is constructed by computing the maximum response of a series of single degree of freedom oscillators to the excitation, and then using this response spectrum, the maximum response in each direction for each node is calculated. The modal responses in each direction are combined using the specified combination method, which is specified by the user. And the final response is calculated by combining the response from the three directions using the square root of the sum of the squares method. The methods described in the following subsections are available in Autopipe. The user can choose the method to combine the response of the individual modes in Autopipe. In Autopipe, there are four codes that contain seismic response spectrum calculations that are valid for piping systems and other non-structure components. And these codes determine the response spectrum acceleration, which is used in the analysis 
as the structure response acceleration matrix. The four codes are the IBC 2006 code, the Eurocode 8 Part 1 2004, the Indian IS 1893 Part 1 2002 code, and the Spanish NCSR 02 2004 code. So let's go through them here. The International Building Code, or the IBC, is used in the Response Spectrum dialog box by selecting IBC 2006 in the code field. The scope of the IBC 2006 Chapter 16 is every structure and portion thereof, including non-structural components that are permanently attached to structures and their supports and attachments. And these should be designed and constructed to resist the effects of earthquake motions in accordance with ASCE 7. To determine the period-dependent response acceleration, Autopipe will use the equation shown to the left, which is taken from ASCE Chapter 11. And the variables for this equation are shown on the right. And the variables used in, de in defining this equation are shown on the right and are in Chapter 16. A note is that SS and S1 down at the bottom are variables that are determined by the user, either directly through manual input or indirectly through a valid United States zip code or geographical coordinates. Some of these variables, uh, FA and FB, require the use of a table, and those tables are shown here. The IBC is designed by the International Code Council, and it contains sections for response spectrum calculations of structures, including piping. And there are some required parameters in order to determine the period-dependent structure accelerations. And these parameters include the site class, which is a classification assigned to a site based on the types of soils present and their engineering properties, as defined in section 1613.52. A coordinate option where the user can select the option that can best be used to determine the SS and S1 values. Sites outside of the United States and Puerto Rico should use the user-defined SS and S1 option. A zip code where the user can enter in the United States zip code of the site. A latitude and longitude input where the global location of the construction site can be entered and it's automatically determined if the zip code field is complete. Values from the latitude and longitude fields will be used to determine the SS and S1 values. SS is the map spectral accelerations and factors of gravity. For short 0.2 second periods is determined in section 1613.51. And S1 is the map spectral accelerations and factors of gravity for one second period as determined in section 1613.51. FA is the site coefficient for the mapped spectral accelerations at short 0.2 second periods, which is defined in table 1613.531, and it's always disabled. FV is calculated as the site coefficient for mapped spectral accelerations at one second periods, defined in table 1613.532, and this is also always disabled. Next is the long period, which is the transition period between the first and second logarithmic regions in the acceleration plot. This also determines the maximum time value T, which is 1.5 times TL. Next is the frequency over the period increment, which is the resolution of the table and plot. The accelerations are interpolated from the periods during the dynamic analysis. And lastly is the option to show location on the map, and this confirms the location selected by viewing it using Google Maps. The mapped spectral accelerations for short and one second periods are taken from the U.S. Geological Sur Survey website. This rectangular gridded data assumes a 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years, and the tables are broken into four regions with varying release years. For the continental U.S., it's 2008, for Alaska, 2007, for Hawaii, 1998, and for Puerto Rico, 2003. An important note is that data from the U.S. Geological Survey is only valid for the continental United States, Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. 
So Autopipe will display an error message for any invalid geological coordinates, and SS and S1 values should then be manually entered. Eurocode 8 is used in the response spectrum dialog box. Eurocode 8, part 4, is the design of silos, tanks, and pipelines for earthquake resistance. This section of the code states that the seismic action to be used in the determination of the seismic action effects for the design of silos, tanks, and pipelines shall be that defined in Eurocode 8, part 1, in the various equivalent forms of elastic, site-dependent response spectra. Therefore, Autopipe uses part 1, which contains general elastic response spectrum equations. The equations are broken into two types of spectra, elastic response spectrum and design response spectrum. The spectra are divided into two types, type 1 and type 2, as defined by the user. Table 3.2 and Table 3.3, shown here, contain period constants and soil factors, which are defined by the spectrum type and the ground type for the horizontal spectrum. This shows the calculation for the elastic response spectrum, which includes both a horizontal elastic response spectrum and a vertical elastic response spectrum, which can be found in the Autopipe help. This shows the calculation for the design response spectrum, including a vertical design spectrum, again, which can be found in the Autopipe help. So Euro codes are a set of harmonized technical rules which are developed by the European Committee for Standardization for Structural Designs in the European Union. And the code that is used specifically for earthquake resistance and response spectrums is this Euro code 8 part 1. And when we select this code in the response spectrum dialog box, there are some required inputs. So first we have ground type, which is used to account for the influence of the local ground conditions on the seismic action. This may also be done by additionally taking into account the influence of the deep geology on the seismic action. And the sites, the sites should be classified according to the value of the average shear wave velocity. Next is the direction, which determines the spectrum direction equations to be used. Both elastic and design spectra have both a horizontal and vertical equation set. Next is spectrum which determines if the desired response spectrum will be elastic or design. Elastic is used for a typical earthquake motion at a given point and is assuming a linear elastic response. Design is to be used in the case of structural systems resisting seismic actions in the nonlinear range, and this generally permits their design for resistance to seismic forces smaller than those corresponding to a linear elastic response. Next is load type, which is used to determine the lower and upper limit of the period of the constant spectral acceleration branch, as well as the value defining the beginning of the constant displacement response range of the spectrum and soil factor. Next is the design ground acceleration, which is a, the product of the importance factor and the reference peak ground acceleration and factors of gravity. The default value is 0.1 seconds, and it can be found in the nation annex under the reference peak ground acceleration. Next is the behavior factor, which is an approximation of the ratio of the seismic forces that the structure would experience if its response was complete elastic with a 5% viscous damping to the seismic forces that may be used in the design with a conventional elastic analysis model. And this option is only applicable to the design spectrum. And lastly is the frequency over the period increment uh, this is a resolution of the table and plot, and the accelerations are interpolated from the periods during the dynamic analysis. The Indian IS-1893 code can be selected in the response spectrum dialog box. The Indian IS Part 2 code contains provisions on liquid retaining tanks, and this part states that it should be used in conjunction with the Indian IS-1893 Part 1 code. Therefore, Autopipe considers the general response spectrum equ equations located in Chapter 6. An important note is that for vertical considerations, the vertical acceleration spectrum can be taken as two-thirds of the horizontal acceleration spectrum shown here. So the Indian Standards IS-1893 Part 1, 2002, is designed by the Borough of Indian Standards, the BIS, Part 1 details the criteria for earthquake resistance design of structures. And when this is selected, there are two inputs required. 
First is the subsoil class, where the user can select the type of subsoil that dominates the area the piping structure will be built on. And next is the frequency over period increment, which is the resolution of the table and plot. The accelerations are interpolated from the periods during dynamic analysis. The Spanish NCSR 02 2004 standard is intended to provide the criteria to be followed within Spanish territory within the consideration of the seismic action in the project, construction, reform, and conservation of that buildings and works to which it is applicable in accordance with the provisions in Article 1.2. Article 1.2 states that this standard applies to the design of new plant buildings as well as other types of structures located in Article 124. And this article refers to Section 2.2, the calculations of seismic accelerations. The reported response spect spectrum acceleration is AT, which the calculation of is shown to the left where the variables shown can be defined in the auto pipe help. C specifically is the terrain coefficient, which is defined through the type of terrain, which is determined in the Spanish NCSR 02 2004 response spectrum parameters and table 2.1, which is shown here to the right. So NSCR 02 or seismic building standards is a Spanish rule. Typically the NCSR 02 standard proposes proposes a calculation method like its predecessor, the NCSR 94, using traditional methods of project-based seismic resistance. NCSR 02 is focused on the safety of the structure but does not quantify the damage so that its findings are only valid in the ultimate limit state. When selected, there are some required inputs, starting with basic seismic acceleration, which depends on the site location and this is a user-defined field which is used to determine the ground amplification coefficient S and it's represented in factors of gravity. Next is the construction risk which determines whether the structure is of normal or special construction. This is used to define the dimensionless coefficient of risk. For normal the coefficient of risk is 1 and for special it's 1.3. Next is the terrain type where the user can select the type of terrain the structure is built on. Next is the coefficient of contribution, which is the influence of the different types of earthquakes. It determines the limits of regions 2 and 3 in the plot. Next is the coefficient of ductility behavior, which is a ductility coefficient that represents the structure's ability to resist spectral movement. And lastly, again, is the frequency over period increment. At this point, we will move on to our wind loads. The load wind command enables the user to define static wind load cases. There can be up to a maximum of 10, and it's done by generating a wind pressure versus system height profile. It can be calculated according to ASCE 702, ASCE 710, ASCE 798, or the Uniform Building Code requirements, or by entering a user profile. The wind force is applied as a uniform load in the local coordinate system of the straight pipe or bend element. The equivalent wind force is assumed to act through the centroid of the element. In order to exclude piping inside a building from wind loads, the piping inside should be entered as a separate segment from the piping outside the building. An important note is that beam members are not subjected to wind loads. Looking at the wind dialog box, there are five distinct inputs in the top section, starting with ground elevation for wind. This is where the user can enter the global vertical coordinate to use as the ground elevation for the wind load applications. No wind load is applied below this elevation. This elevation will be treated as the datum, making it the same as height equals zero in the wind load profile. For more accurate results, place a note everywhere the pipe crosses this ground elevation. Prior to AutoPipe version 6.2, wind loads were applied to negative elevation points for ASCE and UBC wind codes. The wind forces for negative elevations were similar to ground elevation wind forces, which are typically non-zero. In order to apply wind forces for negative elevation points in this version, it may be necessary to set the ground elevation to the lowest elevation in the model, and this could lead to conservative wind loads for above ground points for ASCE and UBC profiles. Next is the wind shape factor multiplier. 
Here, the user can enter the factor by which the wind pressures will be multiplied to obtain the pressure on the pipe. If stagnation pressures are to be input, a value of 0 0.6 will normally be entered. But if the pressures to be entered have already been adjusted for the shape factor, as in the case of ASCE and UBC profiles, the user would want to enter 1, which is the default. A note is that the ASCE code refers to this shape factor as the force coefficient CF, and the UBC refers to it as the pressure coefficient CQ. The user can use this factor to scale the wind loads for ASCE and UBC codes if needed. The ASCE and UBC wind profiles listed in the load summary report do not account for this factor. The wind shape factor multiplier must be greater than or less than zero, but cannot be equal to zero. If this is set to zero, an error message will be displayed. Next is the all segments exposed to wind checkbox. The user can, can enable this option to include all segments in the wind load analysis. By default, this option is enabled. When disabled, the user would have to verify the segments that are exposed to wind on the segment tab of the review component data input grid. To exclude any segments or all segments from the wind load, please use apply wind field on the segment tab of the input grid. The next input is for wind exposure factor for soils. This value determines the extent to which buried pipes are exposed to wind. In most cases, buried pipes are not exposed and this factor defaults to zero. However, pipes lying on flat land or in shallow open trenches may be exposed to the effects of wind and in such cases, the user can enter one. This will assume that all buried pipes are exposed to full intensity of the wind in all directions. For partially exposed buried pipe systems, use this factor in conjunction with the segment exposure field. Lastly is the wind application method. From this selection list, pick the application method to be performed for the wind pressure on the pipe. The projected force method is the default, and ASCE7 and Stumweizen recommend this method. In this method, the projected area of the pipe per perpendicular to the direction of the wind is used to determine the magnitude of the wind force. The wind force is then applied to the pipe in the direction of the wind. In the normal method, the component of the wind pressure normal to the pipe is considered and the longitudinal component is ignored. Then below we have the option to create new wind cases, delete selected wind cases, or delete all. And with a specific wind case selected, you can also modify. When there is a wind case shown, the user has the option to select a wind specification type which will be used to define the wind profile for that specific wind case. The wind specification types are ASCE 798, ASCE 702, ASCE 710, UBC, and a user profile. Once the wind specification type is defined, the user can then select a direction to apply that specific wind load. The duplicate current case 2 on the very bottom allows the user to create an identical case to the one currently selected. The user can input the wind case to overwrite and then click duplicate, and AutoPipe will automatically duplicate the selected wind case without further prompting. The UBC wind profiles generate a wind load which acts on the system model per the requirements of the US UBC 97 code. When UBC is selected as the wind specification type, the wind profile dialog is filtered to provide the following fields. First, we have the basic wind speed at 33 feet. The valid input range for this field is 70 to 130 miles per hour. The wind speed is mainly used to calculate the stagnation wind pressure as per UBC 1997 table 16F, which is shown here to the left. For values outside the range of 70 to 130 miles per hour, enter any value for wind speed and manually set the stagnation wind pressure by extrapolating. The wind speed is dependent on the geographical location in the US and it can be determined from figure 16.1 in the UBC code. The UBC defines the basic wind speed as the fastest mile wind speed associated with an annual probability of 0.02 measured at a point 33 feet above the ground for an area having exposure category C. The next 
The next input is the CE factor, which can be found from table 16G, shown to the right. The UBC code defines a single factor, the CE factor, to take the height, exposure, and gust effects into account. It's recommended to use the default value automatic for all cases. When automatic is used, Autopipe computes this factor based on the exposure category and the table 16G of the UBC code. The load summary will automatically list the computed CE factors as a function of height. The next input is the pressure coefficient, which can be found from table 16H to the left. Enter the pressure coefficient or the wind shape factor, CQ, that's going to be used for the system. The factor is found in table 16H. For chimneys, tanks, and solid towers, a value of 0.8 is given by this table. Next is the wind pressure using table 16F to the right. The user should enter the pressure coefficient or the wind shape factor, CQ, to be used for the system. Next is the wind pressure, which can be found from table 16F, shown to the top right. The user should enter the wind stagnation pressure, QS, at a standard height of 33 feet, as found in this table. Or the user can select automatic if you would like for Autopipe to compute the pressure by interpolating table 16F. Next is the importance factor, which is the factor IW for the structure. This factor is usually one for most structures, but for essential and hazardous facilities, a value of 1.15 is recommended. The UBC table 16K, shown on the bottom right here, gives the importance factors as per UBC. Only positive values are valid. And lastly is the wind direction, where the user should select the global x, y, z, negative x, negative y, negative z, or an incline direction to specify the direction of the wind. If an axis is selected, no other data will be required in the dialog. If incline is selected, the direction cosines or offsets must be entered. Upon saving the incline direction vector, the vector will then be normalized. So here's the screenshot for the UBC wind profile and the load summary shown to the right. The UBC wind profile is a function of height, and it will be printed in the load summary subreport in the input listing.rpt file. AICE wind profiles act on the system model per the requirements of the AICE 798 code. When AICE 798 is selected as the wind specification type in the wind profile dialog box, there are some additional fields required for input. Starting with the basic wind speed at 33 feet, ASCE 798 and 702 defines this as the nominal design three second gust wind speed at 33 feet above ground for the exposure C category. This depends on the geographical location. ASCE 798 and 02 both provide maps for the wind speed in the USA. The basic wind speed will vary from 85 miles per hour in the US West Coast states to 170 miles per hour in Guam, and it can be determined from figure 6-1, provided in the ASCE 7 code. And here to the left, we're just showing the U.S. West Coast states and the U.S. East Coast states. The next input is the exposure category, which reflects the characteristics, such as the topography, the existing buildings, and other factors of the ground surface that affect the wind load. There are four exposure categories defined by ASCE 798, and they are shown here to the right. The next input is the exposure case for KZ. This field is activated for exposure categories A and B only, and valid entries are only 1 and 2. Case 1 is more conservative. The default case is case 2. Case 2 is consistent with the earlier version of ASCE 7 in 1995 and this option affects the calculated KZ factor. The definition of cases 1 and 2, as per table 6-5, are shown to the left. Case 1A is all components and cladding. Case 2B is all main wind force resisting systems and other structures. And the ASC 798 defines components and cladding as elements of the building envelope that do not qualify as part of the main wind force resisting system. The next input is the gust effect factor. This value, value G, is used to take into account the fluctuating nature of the wind and its interaction with the structure. The default value of 
0.85 is recommended by ASE 798 for all exposure categories, assuming a rigid structure with a natural frequency greater than 1 hertz. But for flexible structures, uh, the calculated gust factor would be given in section 6582 of ASCE 798. Autopipe will ignore the effects of the speed up over hills. It assumes that the pipe will not be on an isolated hill, and for that it assumes a KZT of 1. The next input is the force coefficient, CF value, which can be found in table 610, shown to the right, for chimneys, tanks, and similar structures in the ASC 798 code. The force coefficient here is a function of the height over the diameter ratio. The next input is the importance factor, I, which is used to scale the basic wind speed. The user can enter a value from table 6.1, shown to the left for both the ASCE 798 and O2 codes. And this factor is the function of the structural category as given by the ASCE 7 table 1, 1. And only po positive values are valid. And lastly, again, a wind direction needs to be selected. So here's the screenshot for the ASCE 798 wind profile dialog box. To the right is the load summary showing the ASCE wind profile as a function of height. Again, this can be printed by selecting the load summary subreport in the model input listing. The ASC 702 wind profiles act on the system model per the requirements of the ASC 702 code. When ASC 702 is selected as the wind specification type, a wind profile dialog box is generated with some required fields. The first field is the basic wind speed at 33 feet, which is the same as the ASCE 798 code. Next is the exposure category. This reflects the characteristics of the ground surface affecting the wind loads. And for the O2 code, there are now only three defined exposure categories, B, C, and D, shown on the bottom left. Next is the exposure for KZ which is the same as for the ASCE 798 code. The next input is the consider wind speed up input. The ASCE 702 and ASCE 710 codes support the possibility of a hill or escarpment upwind of the piping structure and its effects to the wind profile upon reaching the structure. To enable this option, the user can select the wind speed up input box and there will be some open input fields relevant to this feature. So the first field is the type of hill or escarpment. This option will directly affect the topographic factor, the KZT. An escarpment is defined as a steep slope or cliff that marks the boundary of a flat or gently sloping upland area, such as a plateau. A hill is defined as an area of land, usually rounded in shape, that's higher than the surrounding land. And options for this drop-down include a 2D escarpment, a 2D ridge, and a 2D axisymmetrical hill. The next input is the height of the hill or escarpment. The user should input the overall height of the hill or escarpment in feet that the wind profile will travel, and this is relative to the upwind terrain. The next input is the distance upwind of crest. The user should enter the upwind length of the landform in feet to where the difference in the ground elevation is half the height of the hill or escarpment. The next is the distance from the crest to the structure. The user should enter the distance upwind or downwind in feet from the crest to the site of the piping structure. And lastly is the structure location. For wind load cases with a hill or escarpment, the user should determine if the structure is upwind or downwind from the defined crest or hill because this will affect the topographic factor, the KZT, for the two-dimensional escarpments only. The ne next basic uh, input for the ASCE 702 wind profile is the gust effect factor, which is defined similarly to the ASCE 798 code. And the next input is the force coefficient, again similar to the ASCE 798 code. Here again shows the importance factor input, which is used to scale the basic wind speed, and it's taken from Table 6.1 of the ASCE 798 and 02 codes. And lastly, the wind direction needs to be defined. So there are wind 
Loading calculations defined for ASCE 702 in the auto pipe help. So refer there if you're interested in learning more. And here's the dialog box for the ASCE 702 wind profile. And to the right is the load summary, which shows the ASCE wind profile as a function of height. Again, printed by selecting the load summary sub report in the model input listing. The ASCE 710 wind profiles act on the system model per the requirements of the ASCE 710 code. When ASCE 710 is selected from the wind specification type, again, a wind profile dialog box is generated and some fields are required. Again, we have a basic wind speed at 33 feet. This is basically the same as the 98 and 02 codes. However, now the maps have been updated a bit. We have an exposure category. The exposure category, again, reflects the characteristics of the ground surface that affect the wind loads. And there are three exposure categories for AC 710, shown to the right here, exposure B, C, and D. The next input is the consider wind speed up, which is the same as it was in the ASCE 702 wind profile. Along with the next two inputs, the gust effect factor and the force coefficient, which is found from the table to the right. And lastly, the wind direction needs to be defined. The ASCE 710 wind loading calculations are also shown and defined in the auto pipe help, which can be referenced to. And here's a screenshot of using the ASCE 710 wind profile and the load summary that is produced showing the ASCE 10 wind profile as a function of height. The last option for wind loads is to select a user profile. So selecting profile as the wind specification type allows the user to generate a user-defined stepwise pressure versus system height wind profile, which will act on the system model. When profile is selected as the wind specification type, there are some inputs that are required by the user. First, there is height and wind pressure, where the user can enter the height pressure data pairs for the wind profile. A maximum of 10 data pairs is allowed for each wind case. The first height field references the ground level of the piping system as defined on the main wind load dialog. No wind loading can be applied below the defined ground level. Specific height values entered in these fields are relative to the entered ground level for wind, and the height values must be positive and greater than the previous height value. When the first point of the last pressure zone is reached, press tab, press tab to accept the default value of highest and tell autopipe that the final wind pressure to be entered next acts from the previous height to the top of the structure. The highest point in the system is defined as the point with the highest global vertical axis coordinate value. And then, of course, the wind direction down at the bottom needs to be defined here also. An important note for the user profile is that the wind pressure will be constant within each height zone specified. It varies stepwise with height. This will conclude our webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar, and I'd like to invite you to join us for additional webinars that will be occurring in the coming months. Thank you.